And we're going to welcome back to the Independent Investor Channel. We have a very, very special show for you guys today. We have a couple of uh, guests here that uh, follow the Aduro Clean t uh, Technology story, uh, and they are um, the foregone experts on this topic. And you guys are going to want to sit back and enjoy what has been a phenomenal 2023 here for Aduro Clean Technologies. Much going on currently on the landscape, much has transpired over this year, and it just makes us that much more optimistic looking toward the future. We've got Yazan in the group here, uh, who is a subject matter expert on all things Aduro, as well as Mariush, who runs a YouTube channel and was the very first one to break this story for the grander YouTube audience. So you guys can do them both a softy kick down into the comments section and offer your uh, appreciation, give them a thanks and a thumbs up for their efforts because we are in debt to them for their time. Uh, I want to kick it off with Yazan first and allow him to kind of update us on the uh, current progress uh, and the goings on with Aduro. So with that, I'm going to kick it over and welcome you to the channel. Yazan. Thank you so much for having me. And it is always a pleasure to come on your channel. So um, what I wanted to do with this is I wanted it to be because there's been a lot that has happened since I would say, you know, the summertime with Aduro. And I think a lot of times what happens is with a lot of the headlines that are happening, whether, you know, uh, geopolitical uh, economy, so on, people forget about their high conviction uh, stories. So I thought, uh, you know, take a step back go back to the time where I think things started to get exciting. And I think that started when the company announced um, their HPU uh, is up and running. And I, I believe that was sometime in the summer. So what happened there is that they have successfully commissioned their R2 reactor. Um, and what that does is it, it is able to upscale uh, various types. To date, they say four out of these seven families of plastic waste. Um, and they've been able to uh, start to generate data and gather that data. And the concept here is what they want to do is they want to do two things. One is they want to do a what they call the customer engagement program which we'll talk about in a minute. And the second, which is a paid program, uh, whereby a partner, um, I like that, uh, I'm gonna borrow from, from Penny, the, she conned the term, uh, try it till you buy it. <laughs> and that, that term kind of, you know, what it, what, it, what it kind of boils down to is, it allows partners, potential partners, to kind of do a test run on uh, their feedstock and see what are the outcomes. Is it better than the competition as Aduro claims? And if it is, then they can stock, start talking about partnerships, commercial, and the like. So um, so that, that that's one part of why they need the data. The second part, and this team, as Mary mentioned a couple of times, these guys are working 16 hours nonstop seven days a week, I think. And, um, and the reason is now, outside of doing that, they're also um, starting to collect data in order to start the design and, and the engineering phase of R3, which is the tons per day. So just for a reminder for people that um, are not up to speed, the R2 is the uh, continuous flow reactor that can process few kilograms per or few liters per hour up to 100 uh, or 120 kg per day and then the next phase is going to be the one where they're going to be do dealing with tons per day so so that's the purpose of you know hpu up and running now after that or in the same pr they also mentioned that they've established the act uh, e, which is the European angle of Aduro. At the beginning, people were like skeptical. Why are you doing that? So, you know, why are you opening a second hub 
um, you know, at this stage. And I think to parlay that, a few months later, Eric Appelman, who is one of the heads at Brightlands, who has seen the technology, has seen it since two and a half years. He was the first guy to say, we have not seen a similar technology like this come across Brightlands for, um, for 20 years. He decided to join them as the chief revenue officer. And again, to borrow from Mary Champagny, you know, the significance of, of that is you don't hire a chief revenue officer if you're not going to get revenue. <laughs> so it, it, the concept is obviously you're getting closer, uh, w w which was kind of the hook to the fact that they started getting more engagements, uh, which we will touch on in a minute. So I think that was very important um, uh, in terms of, you know, where, where things are at. I'm, I'm going to talk in a minute about the HPU, but I'm going to continue to kind of with that, with that line. The other thing that happened during this time is Airheads went out with a valuation report, an independent valuation report that came out uh, for our Canadian audience three dollars sixty to five dollars and for our u.s audience it's about roughly two dollars sixty u.s to around 360 us something like that now it's worth noting that and i think mary touched on this it's worth noting that that report was clear it said it's based on um some of these comparables are not really the best but they said it's based on the discounted cash flows of the company. But again, this is assuming that, again, Aduro is using small players, players that are not the players that we've started seeing or hearing about, not the shells or the multi-billion dollar players that they started announcing. So, um, and these are important because, you know, the entire business model till now is very much discounted. But even at that severe discount, $2.60 to $3.60 US represents, call it an average of 200 and some percent upside from here in 12 months. Um, that's not something to kind of you know joke about. In, in my opinion, it's to the downside because again, of the caveat that they made clear. I also liked in that, uh, in that valuation report that they said, that the value of the IP alone should be worth over a hundred million, and that being that's being conservative. So, you know, even today, and you know, I, I read somewhere that you know we're we're about uh, close to fifty-five or sixty million US. So even today, we're nowhere near, you know, the the these you know, metrics. We're just like too far away from the. So I, I think what's happening here is we, uh, and I, I think Mary and I have spoken about this. The only reason why the share price was kept kind of quiet was they had the free trading financing that was done uh, in April that was, that kept the lid on the stock. Then they had some warrants at eighty cents Canadian that came in that kept the lid. And now what we're starting to see is we're starting to see that the only supply that is out there are basically the dollar warrants that expire in April and 50 cent warrants that expire in 2025. So if you are a holder of these warrants, okay, you're most likely into, a, into this nice dilemma where you're like, I can sell the warrant, exercise it, and make 20, 25 percent roughly if you're a dollar Canadian uh, warrant holder. But the other the other alternative is I still have few months till April. The 50 cent uh, warrant holder has a bigger dilemma because they're deeper in the money, but they have a year and a half still. So it's ki quite interesting and that offers what you, you were telling me, um, Brian, about, you know, 
luckily we're in, in the stage where um, we're not seeing a lot of selling pressure. And I, I think this is what's happened. It's a lot of this has been cleaned up. People are starting to wake up um, and I'm seeing more and more people talking about this name. Um, one other thing I want to mention from Airheads um, is that they make it clear that most institutions till now, uh, based on the meetings that they had, cannot invest in Aduro at the current valuation. They need at least 100 million US of a market cap. So this is the delta for, if you want to call it kind of the retail delta um, before institutions come in. And that doesn't mean that the institutional head, so, you know, I understand from Ofer that some of the uh, institutions that they met with, family offices and so on, on a personal level, they started buying the stock, but not, they can't buy it for their clients because it has to cross that threshold of 100 million US. So, um, and I'm gonna conclude with uh, the last thing that I kept the, the you know, the most imp important to the last, which is that uh, last press release that we got. And I think people still undermine the significance of this. You don't get four multi-billion dollar companies to test partner pay for your service for your technology if it if it's not something different than everything that they've seen and that's the that's the crux of it so when you read it when you read that uh, last press release you know that customer part participation or engagement program you will see that the two multi-billion dollar companies uh, that have multi-billion dollar in sales are in the petrochemical space. They are focused on helping Aduro, partnering with Aduro, helping Aduro towards going to commercial. Look, no one's going to be doing this just because they want to do some testing and move on. If it's working the way that they're that Eric has said, and he said, like, what makes you bifurcate or leave a stable job to a, um, you know, to a startup? He said the results, you know, you go to a lot of these clients, you, you test the feedstock and the results show show it all. So um, I'll, st I'll take stock here. I know I've taken a bunch of time. Happy to address any questions. Um, and I'll pass it back to you, Brian. I, I think for the grander audience, I think I would recommend that you go back and play Yazan's piece again, actually. Um, thank you, Yazan. Your summary of the goings on, especially in the, in the short term here, uh, just the back half of this year, really sets up for um, an exciting 2024. And I spoke with O for some point last year, and he was explaining to me what 2023 was going to look like. And I think not only did he deliver on those fronts, but uh, he surpassed a lot of my expectations. Um, you were right, 57 million here, USD, Yazan on the figures, uh, up year to date 31% and up uh, year over year by about 45%. Um, I still think the stock is sleeping. Um, I think what I wanted to say is in face of this current market that we have, that has been absolutely atrocious, that has been picking apart at every company out there, you name it, large cap growth, all the way down into the micro cap space, which I'm going to turn it over to Mariush, who's a featured channel of mine on YouTube because he's a subject matter expert on this topic. And I don't know if he would share in my sentiment, but I think it's been absolutely atrocious investing in 2023. And we've got this bright spot here in 2023 um, called Aduro Clean Technologies, which if you look at it top to bottom, you look at the starts stock, you look, you look at the charts, you look at the performance, you look at the delivery of information. I think you can quickly ascertain that uh, they've earned everything they've got and then some, and it really sets them up for a, an amazing 2024. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mariush 
uh, to go ahead and comment on on Yazan's comment and then give his twist on on the Aduro story thus far. Mariush, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, I to say that this market has been a how did you say it? A, atrocious? Atrocious. I yeah, mean, atrocious. It's, 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 an under, it's an understatement. Yeah, it's, in, it's in the toilet, man. It's, a, it's an understatement. Like, I don't think I have ever experienced the market being as horrible as it is right now. You know? It, and and it's, it's just like a never-ending torture. Um, but because of this, people people like underestimate Aduro. They, they underestimate or don't appreciate what they have. Um, they think that they have all the time in the world. Um, but, you know, I've, I've looked at when I wrote my Coronavirus book, I've looked at, I would say 6000 companies one by one. It, you don't find things like Aduro very often. You just don't. Uh, and here we have this, you know, major solution to a problem. And and we have, like Yazan said, four multi-billion dollar companies at the table testing this thing. And if they are testing on R2, which is the continuous continuous process, that means the batch system already satisfied them. The chemistry already proved to them that it works. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. All, all, all they're trying to do now is to make sure that whatever already worked for them is also going to work on a continuous flow basis. And when I was there in Canada, uh, my understanding is that uh, running these things on continuous flow improves results from the batch system. Uh, and now we get clue after clue after clue. And as Yazan said, Eric, I interviewed Eric. I think Yazan, you you called him Mr. Uh, Mister Recycling. Uh, he, he is? Yeah. I mean, look at his CV. Okay, yeah. And tell me if there is any person better to come in and, and validate the, uh, you know, Aduro. The guy comes, you know, has worked at Unilever. He worked at several plastic producing companies. Then he decided for six years to be at the hub of the plastic recycling and in one of the largest hubs where his work with Sabic, BSF, Shell, you name it. And he decided that this is his next thing. I mean, it, it just, you gotta, you gotta take a step back and see these guys, like he's very calculated. You know, you've seen it in his interview. He's very, he's a very shrewd, smart guy. He's not, he hasn't done this on a leap of faith. You don't spend two and a half years looking at something before you make a move unless you know that that move makes total sense yeah and and you know when i interviewed him I, and a lot of times when you interview somebody you're kind of in the mode of interviewing and you don't see the impact of the responses and then you replay the video and and you you get goosebumps you're like this is insane um but also you know one other thing that uh, investors don't really understand what they have is that they take it for granted because mo most of the time companies like this uh retail investors don't get a chance to buy into them because they most of the time stay private and the private hands or private equity they get you know they get taken to a certain level and then they get kind of like a product right like a retail product they get packaged properly the story is told properly, and then they get they get taken IPO at billion dollar valuations, and then 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 the Jeremy's of the world, the uh, you know uh, what's this other guy? 
Kevins of the world get, you know, catch on to these things. Uh, retail gets introduced to those names at a billion dollar valuation. And we see now over and over uh, various companies getting acquired. They're so cheap. And I know Ryan is kind of nodding his head because I've seen some of his videos with uh, Hellion or whatever you call the, the name of the company. But you see it over and over and over. Private equity comes in, scoops up these cheap companies. And what they're going to do with them is they're going to finance them. They're going to prepare them in two years and they're going to take them out at you know billion dollar valuations. And because retail community today doesn't care about those names today, don't want to, you know, support them to enough valuations for those companies to stay public. And as a result, private equity comes in, gets them out, but the private equity will get the benefit of the growth. Retail investors are going to, they, they always complain how the hedge funds are there. You know, they make all the money. We, we get the scraps and here, here you have an opportunity to, to get great companies and they just refuse to get them. And I bet, I bet, I think Yazan, you, you, you have a lot of conversations with, uh, with various bankers. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, you know, some kind of interest, uh, to, to take, to take over Aduro and then sometime down the road, you know, take it public. Um, do, do you have any comment on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I am, um, I was talking today with, with a banker um, and he said, look, I mean, um, the exact same theme that you're saying. He actually mentioned Canadian uh, and it was interesting. He's like private equity in the U.S. And Mary, she covered, I think, two or three of them um, got, are really on a hunt to acquire companies that in their view they're extremely undervalued they know that you know especially with the exchange rate being what it is it makes it very lucrative um if you think about it a company like um you know uh, like a couple of the companies that you mentioned they give them 200 percent premium 200 premium, percent premiums to take them out is not normal. Typically, in a normal market, what premium do you think a takeout is? 30, 50%. To give 200%, it tells you that the private equity sector is just saying, guys, you have this wrong. We know how to take it from X, add to it some cash, fix a few things, and in a year or two, we're going to you know, sell it on NASDAQ or on a bigger exchange to someone or maybe privately. And this is one of the things that I read and I agree with. Some people have said that their main fear is that Adura gets taken out early. And I agree that that's a, a risk. The one advantage or saving grace that we have is that Ofer and the insiders own close to 43, 44% of the company. So any takeover has to go through a vote by shareholders. That being said, I mean, the, the issue is it's not just, um, you know, if, if you put yourself in, in the shoes of the operator and Mary, you, you spoke about that. You have here, you have a market which is very turbulent every day every day you are judged by the share price that you're at it doesn't matter what people say i don't care what people tell you um we love the product we don't love the product you you're doing a, a solution that's you know to a world problem or not what you're judged on is your share price that's 99 percent of people will will say now and and then these two opportunities you mentioned and you know i i suspect to see others are getting you know someone to say to them you know what you don't have to worry about all this you worry about what you're good at which is operating a business 
running the business, improving it smoothly. And guess what? You as founders, you're going to get two, three hundred percent premium on your on the current market cap. You know, they're, they're like, OK, you know what? We don't we didn't want to, but it's such a hardship of raising capital dealing with you know the average folk that says oh i don't like this you know you issued this on um the other day we had this kind of conversation oh this ted danson coverage didn't get enough eyeballs um this thing didn't like there's always a critic and to them it's like you know why do i need to do with all this i could simply cash out and go into operating mode and be focused on the business and, and by cashing out doesn't mean that they are gonna sell completely they they could retain uh you know a significant position still but i'm just saying that you know we take things for granted until they're not but even even just what people don't understand is dealing dealing with the shareholder base it is exhausting to deal with them. It is exhausting. I want to like murder half of the shareholder base in my companies. Okay. It is exhausting for these operators. So I will, I'm just not surprised that they're like, I'm going to take the 200% premium not to deal with the moronic people. I, th I think I'm very used to your point. Right. I, I think a lot of people just get in over their skis. OK, so although I agree with you, my sympathy only goes so far. Um, this is a company at the end of the day that's just shy of 60 million U.S. And as Yazan said, until it gets to that hundred million market cap, that institutional buying is not going to happen. And the follow on question to that is what is going to happen when they hit that? Because this isn't the first time I've discussed it. Um, it was actually Ofer last year who mentioned that hundred million dollar threshold for for really kind of turning into a whole new arena of companies from that hundred million mark up to a billion dollar mark. Right now, it's market cap. Yuzan, you said it. The stock means everything, okay? And they will not be looked at below the surface until they get to that. And I really think that that right there is going to be a huge catalyst for institutional momentum now i have monitored the volumes over the last year or so and we have been improving in our volumes but you know these tens of thousands of shares that trade hands every day is not going to move the needle uh, to the magnitude that we would expect it to move but I, I you know i do agree with you i i just think that people can probably put themselves at ease by doing a lot more homework and i will also say look how much more do you expect us to do I mean, we're putting it right there on your dinner table. All you got to do is sit down and eat. That's all you've got to do. You know, now there's no promise of follow through. Duro's got a long way to go. I'm one of those in the camp that believe that they will not get bought out. There's always that overhang. I get it. I mean, they are a target right now at their current market cap. Somebody could pick them up on huge value. But where I value it right now on the low end of a couple hundred million dollars, just inclusive of the technology, I don't even have to value the other verticals and I don't have to value the business. We just look at the technology alone. I, I, I think that that gap probably is a blessing in disguise right now. If we were looking at a company that was getting the eyeballs at over a hundred million, and also getting that attention that I think they deserve right now that I think is probably forthcoming. No, I don't I don't think they're gonna get bought out for the reasons that Yazan mentioned. The the insiders own too much stock, they're not going to let it go cheaply. But I do think the end game is getting bought out, but it's gonna have a B billions at the end of it. That's when the insiders might say this is enough, uh, but not not anywhere close to where it is right now. Any thoughts, Yazan? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I recall the days when Ofer was talking to me when this was batch back in 2021. And I think we were, uh, you know, discussing the pre-IPO raise 
with the IBRAs, which was 55 cents. This is laughable. I actually want to take a step back. Like imagine in what happened since going public till today, the company has done so much. Their IPO price was 55 cents Canadian, 40 cents US. We're almost like double that. Like, just take stock of that. You know, we were at batch scale in a very tiny um, lab. We had no clue. We don't have a third party validation. We don't have a following. We don't have Shell. We don't have three other multi billion dollar companies. We don't have three verticals. We don't have a third party validation or valuation saying, it's worth anywhere between, you know, an average of $3 some US. You know, it's just mind boggling. And, and I really think as much as, and you said it best, Ryan, I think at one point you have to, to agree that you have to trust the process, meaning we can do a lot of homework and a lot of We've, we've said the investment thesis. I think there's no one that have spent so much time and energy like Mary Champagny and yourself covering the story. Mary Champagny have put so many, so much content out there. And, you know, at one point, people have to kind of get out of that zone of, we're in a recession, we're going to a recession, we're going to a war, we're going to, and just hold on. Regardless of the conditions, solutions that matter, that resolve worldwide problems will get adopted and will get validated and will get bought out or will get to a certain valuation. And look, I'm not the same person to say, if. We're always going to say the caveat that execution has to continue to be the way it is. And if today we're sitting at a, a billion dollars, there's no way that me, Marius, yourself, Ryan, are going to sit here and say, well, the bullish case is we're going to go to 10. It, it might be. You know, I'm, I'm going to be honest. It, it might be 10. It might be more. But... At 60 million US, the bullish case is so, so much bigger. It's just, the reward to risk is just, you know, skewed towards the reward. The risk is, I can't say it's it's not there because obviously everything can, you know, everything is risky. But I'm going to parlay a comment that I heard the other day. When you see 5.9 or some trillion dollars sitting in money markets because they're scared, because we're going to a recession, we're going the highest levels seen ever. Okay. I always think the crowded trade is not the trade you want to be in. You don't want to be in T-bills. I really don't think that's the play. Because when it's too crowded, like, is everyone there so super smart? And, you know, the rest, like, it's typically, it doesn't work that way. When everyone was saying, we're going to, um, this year, we're going to head to a recession. NASDAQ is going to be below or around 8,000. Guess what happened? We saw what happened in NVIDIA, all the... AI. So consensus to me is not a way to invest. And, and at least that doesn't fit my profile. But some people are contrarians, which that's the camp I, I like to be in. But again, I can't tell people what to do. Uh, and I'll say, again, I'm not, I'm not an investment advisor. I'm not here to tell you buy, sell, do whatever you want. We are here to educate people and tell them that there is an opportunity that, as you said, Ryan, it's almost on, <laughs> on a silver platter. You got to do your digging. Um, I agree. Thank you for that, Yazan. I, I, I 
tend to try not to focus so much on selling the idea of a duro like you said and it's just i I know people who hold positions i'm one of them um a duro from the beginning for me since i did my due diligence actually is a very easy company to hold um i chalk up some of my larger cap investments some that the masses would justify going out there and buying alibaba for example a company like at&t that's absolutely drowning in debt holders Sorry about that. I muted my mic. I was talking about Alibaba and AT&T. But people will do everything they can do to justify just looking at an opportunity like this. Um, For me, it's easy. Um, I don't need to be talked into anything, but I do kind of want to shift the focus a little bit. For those people that actually do own shares, what it actually means to be an Enduro shareholder, what this 2023 is actually meant for the company. Um, what it could potentially look like out to 2024 and beyond. You know, I mean, Aduro has forecasted for us, you know, their their revenue projections based on their licensing model out to 2027. And ever since last year, I started investing in this company. It has been a 2027 first look for me. So, yeah, it's great to look at the stock every day and it's great to monitor the progress which in Aduro's case has been pretty much uh, pretty much positive and spot on. They've executed in 2023 in a way that is fantastic. And, and again, it might just be a blessing in disguise in that the pressure that's building up with Aduro might actually really start to come to fruition come next year. But what is it that we can actually tell would-be share owners to expect potentially for not just reviewing where we currently are, but maybe looking at 2024? I mean, we're going to have the results of Game Changer in December. What that could potentially mean? Aduro's obviously on a path to build out their both international exposure and their team here domestically. The office is under works. R2 is completed. You know, there's just a lot of moving parts here, Yazan. And I would almost rather just continue to focus on driving on those share owners out there that just, dare I say, get it. Yeah. No, I, I think you, you kind of, uh, you're right. I think we got uh, bogged down with the weeds of day to day and we forget about the bigger picture. The problem is not going away. Eric Appleman was very clear when uh, when Mary asked him, he's like, um, 2025 is a deadline, so on. It's like, no, 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 hold on a second. In Europe, right now, it's a problem. Right now, you have to find a solution whereby 35% of the product has to be recycled from a sub 10%. So the selling feature is that and it's the results now i'll tell you what I, what i like to say and we're gonna stick with what can what the company says and then i'm gonna give my own commentary management is focused on getting the results to these counterparts that they're working with and although the sixth phase of shell will finish in december i'm pretty sure same way that they did with the midway you know point shell is very well calculated they're probably gonna vet this they're gonna you know spend some time and they are gonna you know probably take a quarter so q1 uh of next year till we probably hear anything about the outcome but here's one thing that you recall and replay it from the videos that mary should have has had. Ofer mentioned when they signed the agreement with Shell that there was a commercial agreement at the back end of it. So these guys have spent enough time to say that if everything works out, and we're saying if everything, so because we finished only three of the six, then there is going to be a discussion to start about the commercial unit and that's what really matters you know that's where it's going to matter because they will next year there there are a few things that we know will happen so we knew we were going to hear from shell at some point they are gonna they already said they started the design 
um, of R3, that doesn't mean that they started build out, build outs next year. Um, and they are just getting started. So I think where we're, we're going to get to is those two things, the shell side, the R3 is known. Now, what we also now know, which I really like, I always like when you have competition. Competition for you, not against you. So suddenly now the paradigm has shifted because now it's not only Shell that is announced. There are two other mega players, multi-billion players, that are interested in this solution. And clearly neither one of us here can say it's gonna, you know, it's gonna meet their targets, it's not gonna meet, when is it, when is it not? But what that does, and I don't need to explain how big companies operate. If I start seeing that the, uh, there's more tension on a solution that could potentially be taken out by someone else, I might start having a different conversation sooner. So this is why I like the most recent announcement because it just now propels or puts a lot of heat on the other side that they need to start talking. And this is great. I, I do know from Ofer um, that when Eric Appleman joined, a lot of people were like, wow. And I'm talking industry. I'm not talking about like retail. I'm talking about industry players said, wow, you've got something here. So. I think those are the things that we can hang our hat on. Remember, we're all talking about the HP, the the uh, you know, plastic upscaling. HPU we haven't touched on, okay? And that unit is about the R2 HPU is about to get up and running soon. Again, that's a complete huge vertical. I was in talks, and, with there, and there is. And there is another major involved here. That's eighty percent of the work has been done. Yeah. And they're just waiting to run the last twenty percent when it's finished. And, and that major you're referring to is in the oil sands in, in Canada. So, and you did a great video, uh, I, guys. I, truly, if if you look, there's no shortcuts. Okay, you want to be an investor in Enduro, you really want to sleep well at night, you got to go do the homework. There's at least 50, 60 hours worth of diligence that has been done for you. You just need to listen to it a couple of times and you're going to get there. It, it, it's That's what it's going to need. It's going to need you to break the habit of this is, take it serious, take it for what it is, these don't come by that often. And once you get there, you're going to realize why, why, we're, why, we're, why are we this bullish? So going back to the R2 HPU being operational, now the same way they'll start getting traction from industry players. And again, that creates more traction and competition. So those are the things I think we should look at. We should, we should look at what are the outputs, or outcomes from Shell? What are the outcomes from those two new companies that they announced? Um, what, where is HPU, which is the heavy to light? Um, and then, you know, what happens with Prospera? What happens with that? But also what I really like is the fact that one thing that I, I really like about the position that Adura sits in is that they're lucky in the way that they've built their cap table, where by they do have warrants to take them throughout next year. So it's not one of those companies where you're going to be, you know, yes, warrant selling is annoying because they're going to create some pressure on the stock, granted. But what it does is it guarantees that the company does not have to go beg for money you know, during a bad time. So 
so long as obviously share price is holding up and you know uh not going what it does so i think there's quite a lot um to look forward to and that you know and i really think that no matter where you go and, and we're only talking about two verticals you know i always say there are so many others it's like an octopus you know i i think you no matter how you slice the, this thing there's so much upside to it especially from these levels and again i use the caveat of what are we 56 us 56 million us you know, use that as your benchmark use that versus what the independent valuation said you know uh 4x from here use that against what you mentioned uh ryan about you know what the ip is valued use that against your own business logic of what this should be and then go from there and i do and those insights are just absolutely invaluable on behalf of the audience i, I really want to thank you i do want to get mariush on for last word for sure um and I do want to take this opportunity to um, encourage any viewers the content to kick over to Mariusz's channel. He, he's really the first and foremost. He kind of broke the story through YouTube and he needs to have proper kudos, but his videos are fantastic. If you want to learn more about the Aduro story, all you've got to do is just sit back and enjoy the content creator delivering the message to the very best of, of our ability with what we know at the, at the time. Um, and that's the beauty of the deliverance of information nowadays is that these opportunities uh can be presented to somebody that just would have never had the opportunity to have it if it weren't for these uh these um these streams of information and and we really do owe both of these guys uh, a big thank you and, and appreciation for their time but with that i want to thank you yazan and i'm going to kick mariush over because i want him to continue to remain in the pocket with his content because i can tell you what man if you subscribe to his channel he can really make you think and he puts you right in line with the mental mindset that you have to have in succeeding and in investing. Um, it speaks to the majority of people get involved with stock market investing and they run against their very first barrier and they fall over never to invest again. And until we can get over that habit forming behavior and Mary Yush can really condition that mental application, you're really missing out if you're not subscribed. And I'll turn it over to Mary Yush to give his last word on the Aduro story and then we'll look to close down the live stream. Mary Yush? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I never want to tell people to buy or sell something. I, I just provide information. And now, as you said at the beginning, the market is so horrible. I have. I have an army. I have an army of haters out there. Okay, people like on Twitter, they have, they, they, they set up Twitter accounts with my name on it, just a little misspelled. So like, but that's what happens when you're a celebrity. It's my own fault. Uh, but there's a reason why I own almost a million shares. And I'll just leave it at that. I bought it with my own money. You figure it out. You figure it out why I have so many shares. Thank you, Ryan. You betcha. I appreciate your time. And, and Yazan, again, thank you for your time. Um, again, uh, subscribe, sit, stay tuned to the Independent Investor Channel. We're going to continue to cover the story intimately, uh, as we always do. Like I said, this is this is a very easy story for me. Very easy. Um, I, I think they're on an addressable market here that is untapped. Um, we are in the early innings of rolling out this technology, Aduro and a few other players in the space. And it's fascinating. Uh, and I invite you to uh, become part of the movement on the story here and the flow of information as real time as we can deliver it. Uh, Mariush, thank you for your time. And Yazan, we'll talk soon. Gentlemen, take it easy and have a great, great evening. Thank you so much. Have a good one.